This is the Advanced Brain Podcast with third-generation neurotechnology pioneer, entrepreneur, best-selling author, music producer, keynote and TEDx speaker, Alex Doman. Improve your mental wellness as Alex sits down with the leading thought leaders of our time about how to optimize your brain, body, and life with the latest and most powerful tools to help you reach your unlimited potential. This episode was previously recorded and released as part of the Sound Brain Fitness Series and is being re-released here in the Advanced Brain Podcast. Now, listen in and discover how to become the best version of yourself with Alex Doman. Good evening, everyone. This is Alex Stoman. Now, if you follow the brain fitness field, the name Dr. Michael Mersenick will surely ring a bell. Uh, Dr. Mersenick is one of the neuroscientists responsible for our current understanding of brain plasticity, the notion that the brain can change itself at any age. He's also author of the upcoming book, Soft Wired, How the New Science of Brain Plasticity Can Change Your Life. Now, I've followed his research since the mid-90s, and I have to say his work has continued to confirm what we observe in the functional and the behavioral changes that we see in clients using advanced brain technologies products like the listening program. Uh, the auditory human, The human auditory system is highly malleable. It's susceptible to damage with overexposure to noise, resulting in negative plasticity, but conversely, it's responsive responsive with positive neural change when provided with structured auditory training using certain salient sounds. Now, I want to tell you a little bit more about our guest. As co-founder and chief scientific officer of Posit Science, Michael Merzenich heads the company's science team. For more than three decades, Dr. Merzenich has been a leading pioneer in brain plasticity research. In the late 1980s, Dr. Merzenich was on the team that invented the cochlear implant, now distributed by Advanced Bionics. In 1996, Dr. Merzenich was the founding CEO of Scientific Learning Corporation, which markets and distributes software that applies principles of brain plasticity to assist children with language, learning, and reading. Dr. Merzenich has published more than 150 articles in leading peer-reviewed journals such as Science and Nature. He's received numerous awards and prizes and been granted nearly 100 patents for his work. He and his work have been highlighted in hundreds of books about the brain, learning, rehabilitation, and plasticity. Dr. Merzenich's work is often covered in the popular press, including the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Times, Forbes, Discover, and Newsweek. He's appeared extensively on television, and his work has been featured on four PBS specials, The Brain Fitness Program, Brain Fitness 2, Sight and Sound, The New Science of Learning, and Brain Fitness Pioneers. Dr. Mersenick earned his bachelor's degree at the University of Portland and his Ph.D. at Johns Hopkins. He completed a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Wisconsin in Madison before becoming a professor at the University of California, San Francisco. In 2007, he retired from his long career at UCSF as a Francis A. Soy Professor and Co-Director of the Keck Center for Integrative Neuroscience. He was elected to the National Academy of Sciences in 1999 and the Institute of Medicine in 2008. Now, let me share a bit about tonight's call, How Auditory Brain Chain Training Can Change Your Life. Tonight, we're going to explore how can how you can improve your auditory listening abilities with neuroplasticity-based training to sharply improve your conversational, cognitive, speech, and music abilities. We'll also cover how training your brain as a master listener also refines your attentive powers and amplifies your baseline level of arousal, your brightness. Evidence that these gains are attributable to strong, positive, enduring physical changes in your brain, the brain the trained brain is a stronger, better brain. And how combining auditory training and brain training in the other great perceptual and action control domains, you can rejuvenate a struggling brain and if taken seriously, can assure a more effective, happier, and more secure adult life. So welcome, Dr. Merzenich. I'm thrilled to have you on the call as I know our listeners are. Uh, we've got a lot of information to cover, so why don't you go ahead and dive into this fascinating discussion on the miraculous human brain. Uh, thank you, Alex. It's nice to be with you and nice to be with your, your listeners. 
And I want to say at the outset that uh, by all means, uh, as, as I as I talk about this complex subject, uh, please uh, don't be afraid to jump in and uh, and um, and put in anything, say anything corrective or anything that will add enlightenment to the people that are listening. Uh, I want so everyone much. out there to know, Alex, and and, they, and you know that uh, their brain is plastic. And that's one of the things my book, uh, Software, is about. It's to explain to people that they have this asset, and not just them, of course, but every human being, every child, every child that's doing fine and every child that's struggling, every adult that's doing fine and every adult that's struggling. And I want you to know that you have this asset with you as long as you're alive. You can acquire new ability. You can improve what you're up to at any point in life. And you, that means that you have the capacity to change your brain for the better. And one of the things, Alex, that we've been concerned about, as I know you have, is how to marshal that power, how to how to organize that power so that with efficiency and in a reasonable period of time and, and with effectiveness, we can drive changes that will put a person into a better position. So there are a lot of people out there uh, in the normal uh, range of, uh, of performance, and then there are a lot of people out there that are struggling in this way or that, who can really bring this power to bear to give, put them into a stronger and a safer position, and that's really what I want to talk about. I want to say that uh, when you acquire any ability or when you improve any ability, we now know that the brain basically remodels itself. It revises its wiring. It changes its connectivity the way that the way things are wired together. And it does this on the basis of principles of, of the rules, you could say, that we now understand pretty clearly. We understand the conditions that underlie the control of these changes and basically how to drive them purposefully to put the brain into a stronger position. We know that each time you acquire an ability, let's say that you learn to read as a child, if we could look into your brain we'd see that you have a system in place that was acquired by the reading. You now have a reading brain. No non-reader has that brain. No non-reader has that equipment in place because they haven't gone through the brain change, you could say, that puts it in place. When you learn to read or any task like that, complicated task, you've actually constructed a neurological basis for associating what you see in writing with what the word sounds are that represent the words that you're reading. So it's really a translational process by which you translate what you see representing word sounds in vision to what you what you know relates to what you hear when you hear the word. And you actually have to evolve the machinery in your brain. You actually have to grow it by brain change before reading ability can be acquired. And you do that by very slowly and successively changing the wiring of the brain so that you acquire this machinery that can control this ability that you could not control or account for before. Now you've done that, everyone that's listening has done that in hundreds of ways. And basically the combination of all of those ways represents in a sense the product that you are, the very unique and special person that you are. And if I could meet anyone out in your audience, Alex, I know that every one of them would be different. Every one of them would have different sets of skills. Every one of them has had a different passage in life. They've acquired knowledge. They've acquired ability. They're special. In fact, that's one of the miraculous things about this gift, Alex, is that each one of us has the capacity to become a, and do become a special person, unlike no other person that ever was, and in detail, that ever will be. And so the, what I'm going to tell your audience, first of all, is that you have this gift, and you're probably not, most people are not, making full use of it. And that's really one of the things that we want to talk about. How can you make full use of it? And the second part of that is, is that maybe you know somebody or care love about somebody, love somebody that, that's struggling in this way or that, and how to help them understand and how you understand how conceivably you can help them make better use of it. And that's how I've made, that's why I've written this book, Alex, to try to help people understand uh, enough about this to be to, as a sort of guide to appreciate how to marshal these great powers yourself. So that's a little bit of a complicated preamble, but I thought I'd go from that to talk a little bit specifically about one of the most powerful things happening in your brain, one of the most important things that's happening in the brain, and that's your listening capacities that are the basis of our operations in language 
And then something very wonderful that we do in listening, and that's our appreciation and understanding of something we all love, and that's music. So it turns out that one of the things that we do in our young lives is we become, we develop through brain change an understanding of the world that we just happen to have been born into by evolving our brain capacities, by evolving our neurological abilities, and ultimately our brain's job, our job as little children, was to change in ways and change our brain in ways, you could say, in which we understand that world and we gain control of it can train, gain control of our operations within it so that we can have a successful and effective life. Well, of course, we swim in a sea of air, and every time anything vibrates in that air, of course, it comes to our ears and we hear it. And we, and we have this amazing gift of hearing. You know, if you, you can't turn it off in general if you're lucky enough to have hearing. And it's ever present with you, with you. And we have this remarkable evolution in our brains that's unique to humans in part because we have relatively powerful brains, in part because our larynx and our pharynx we, we, and our capacity to control our breathing are special in us. We have the capacity to form what, what our vocalization so that we can produce speech. Of course, we produce speech a rich variety of ways. There are certain principles that relate to every language, but each, each language of the thousands of languages in the world are different. And when a baby is born into the world, it very rapidly modifies itself, its brain, and in a very short period of time in early life, it develops, if, if it's lucky, an ideal processor, an ideal machine for picking off those incredibly fast-changing sounds so that it can interpret, ultimately apply meaning to those sounds to create the understanding of that meaning into development of language abilities in, 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 in the brain. Of course, things always, don't always happen uh, well. It's a pretty challenging thing. You could say the reception of speech and language is right on the edge of the capacity of the brain to deal with these very fast fluctuating sounds. The brain has to resolve information in incredible speed and accuracy for it to be successful. And many children have inherited problems or many children have early histories of deprivation or abuse or other things happen. Probably more commonly, the problem is genetic, but there are also many children that just are deprived of good language exposure, and they don't develop normal competencies. They're left with a brain that's poorly resolving speech, that's pokey, that's difficult, and in the worst level, this could lead to a frustration to develop language understanding, or worse still, to not just language understanding, but mutism, the inability to produce or understand speech. And of course, from that extreme down to the fast talking, fat, uh, brilliantly understanding little child is, there, is a whole range of conditions in between the speed balls and the slow folks. And the simple fact is, is that your brain processing in language is plastic. It, you acquired your gift for operating with high fidelity and high speed, you could say, comes out of your, your language development and, and usage. And at any point in time, we can guide the brain to do a better job of it by appropriately intensively training it. And this is one of the fundamental things, of course, that we do. Now, our brains don't, aren't just involved or trained or move in a positive direction as it develops its language powers. We humans also love to make sound. And we love to be in an environment of structured sound that we hear that is made by others. And we have this incredible uh, love, this propensity attraction from organized sounds that we call within a broad category of music. And in just like sounds that come into us from our speech, the sounds that come into us from the domain of music, as we hear as accurate listeners and appreciate and evolve our understanding of the complexities of those sounds, and also as we make them, because again, just like talking, there's a special connection between making sound and receiving sound that, that mutually empowers both sides of the coin. Uh, we, we, our brains are greatly advantaged by this. And we know this because when we look in the brain of someone that has this history or has a music history, just like somebody that has a good language history, we see that on the statistical average, they have a better brain. And we also see that if we carry a child 
from a position where they have no music training, no music exposure, to a period in their life when they have a good music exposure, we commonly see that they have a, a more advantaged, a more fast operating, more, more accurately operating brain. Music is helpful, just like it, intelligent exercises that drive change in language itself can be very helpful. Sometimes, because music is attractive and relatively simple in its forms, in a child that's very impaired, starting with them with music listening is a good way to start. And then once we've advanced the brain to a point, Alex, where they're, where they're managing and operating at a higher level in their reception of, of sounds coming from structured, the structured sound of music, especially music that's organized to be pers purposeful from the point of view of driving the brain in a better direction, then it's natural to carry the brain from that into language training using oral, oral language stimuli. And that way, often we've seen that we can carry a child that's really struggling from a position of very low performance oftentimes to a relatively useful level of speech reception and, and if we're lucky, language usage. And, Dr. Marsnick, uh, I'd like to interject right there. You know, my uh, my first introduction to your work was very very early in the days of scientific learning when you and right. Paula Talal got started. Sure. And we're training practitioners uh, in the fast forward uh, program. Right. And that was at the time we were we were actually developing and getting ready to uh, introduce the first iteration of the listening program. Right. And what's evolved over. Oh, the past 15 years is practitioners doing a combined approach right. uh, where they'll often use uh, music like the listening program or the listening program as a founder, as a primer or a foundation, mm -hmm. and then build on that with a very specific uh, oral language stimulation and right. find that that combined approach gets really good outcomes, especially for those that may not initially be receptive to a computer-based training, you know, right. I, get I, their I, auditory system ready. I agree with you completely. And, and uh, you know, I, ideally on some level, the music training can be continued in overlap with the language training. And, uh, and that's something we've also been exploring. We've actually done some experiments with another person that's focused on music training in children, uh, Professor Nina Krauss in, at yeah. Northwestern University. And we've become very interested in the sort of continuing dance between exercising the brain in music and exercising in oral language training. And we think the combination of the two, like you say, could be just, the uh, for many of these children, a real a strategy for breaking out. I mean, Alex. For every kid that we can carry out of the uh, out of the out of these uh, out of the situation where they can't express themselves and they can't really they have unreliable understanding of what's happening in the world, and we can bring them back into the world in a sense with the rest of us. And so many frustrations and so many positive things can happen in a child if we can just carry them there. And uh, one of my main goals for for years has been to try to carry as many of these kids over that over that hurdle as possible. And music and brain training of our form, like fast forward, is a useful way to do that. Uh, Alex, I'd like to tell, say another little thing about plasticity that I that I haven't said so far, as a way to talk about plasticity in older children and older adults. And it relates to something we've known from the beginning. And you alluded to a little bit when you introduced me, and that's that plasticity is a two-way street. It's very easy to drive the brain to be a poor resolver and a poor receiver of information from hearing or from vision, or it's very easy to make it poor, not better, at controlling uh, at the movements of the body. Uh, because plasticity can be driven south just as easily as it can be driven north. Now, of course, we would never drive it south, certainly never, ever, intentionally, and we, we are very careful to assure, assure that we never do that. Uh, but one of the important things to understand about it is, is that the brain starts in a relatively disorganized state in a baby, and it progressively organizes itself to reach some maximum in a normal individual. Usually that maximum occurs you know, sometime in the third or fourth decade of life when the brain is forming as high in its operations as it can. And then it turns out that it goes progressively backward 
in the in its operational characteristics. So that as you get older and older and older, as a functional machine, it looks more and more like the brain of a baby. Now we know that because we've looked at the brains in animals and humans in many ways. And we've basically uh, tracked this deterioration of the brain in physical and functional and chemical terms. And, and actually, we've, we've looked in the brains of animals and humans not far from the end of life in different ways. And we see that the brain is operating very primitively, almost as if the animal or human has had no experience or little experience. Now that's rather shocking in a way, but we've also asked the simple question. Now when we look at all of these characteristics of the physical and functional brain, which of these abilities, which of these functional features of the brain can be reversed by training? And the answer is almost all of them. So we've actually been take we were actually able to take the brain of an animal like a rat, look at the animal near the end of life, the animal's very feeble. Their, the, the, their predicted demise is not too far into the future. They're very cognitively impaired. Everything that we look about the brain looks like the brain is, can hardly keep it up in any way. It's slow. It's imprecise. It's full of error. And now we train the animal in particular ways, and we're able to drive the brain back so that it looks, in effect, functionally and physically like it's young again. Now, the reason that this occurs is because the brain is actually adjusting its characteristics of operation. I know this is a little complicated for the audience, but the brain is actually controlling its operational characteristics on the basis of how successful it is. And if it's not very successful, it slows down. And it basically looks, in, in, you could say, in a, in a, uh, at what it's seeing or what it's hearing a little, in a little cruder way. And the reason it's doing that is so it can make some sense out of the world. You know, if you can't really resolve what you're seeing very well, you take longer to look. You basically look more broadly before you make a decision about what it is you see. And the brain actually detects success, and it's controlling its plasticity, its machinery on the basis of that success. Now, the point of all of this is that this is, a, this is the fundamental nature of this machinery. It's designed to go north or south, and you want it to go in a, a north, or maybe if you're from the southern United States, you want to go south, but in, you want it to improve. You want things to go, be going in a corrective direction, not a declining direction. And basically, you can move it in a improving direction by appropriately forms of intensive training, and that's what we do at the brain at Brain HQ, and that's what we've tried to do at Scientific Learning with the Fast Forward programs. Now, one thing I'd like to address is, you know, what what are you attributing to this disorganization that that happens after the third or fourth decade? What, right. Well, that's what, a great. That's what's a causing great, this decline. That's a great question, and of course, uh, there are quite a few chapters in my book about this, Alex. So, uh, but I can tell you what the what a main contributor relates to how we use our brain. So uh, let me just say that it, let's think about it within the domain of music. Let's say that I've I've learned to play the violin. Let's that could be my instrument, and maybe I've learned I've improved my ability to a professional level. And I've done that through thousands and thousands and thousands of hours of practice. And now it, to maintain my professional ability, that is to say to maintain a really high performance ability, guess what I need to do? I need to keep practicing. You say, well, what if I'm a professional violinist, I'm sitting in the orchestra, and I stop practicing? Well, what would happen if I stopped practicing for, let's say, a month? Everyone else around me would be aware that something wasn't quite right with me, that basically I'm losing my performance edge a little bit. What if I didn't practice for a year? Well, I'd probably be in danger of losing my job. Maybe I would have lost my job. Certainly everyone would know that I'm a slacker because they could detect it in the, in the deterioration of the, perform, of the perfection of my performance. If I didn't practice for 10 years, and the simple fact is, is that the losses would be substantial. I would not be a professional. I might still be able to pick up my fiddle and play it and make people cry, but no one would mistake me for an expert, and I wouldn't be one. So you say, well, what if I decided after not practicing for 10 years 
that I could try to recover my position as a professional magician. You could ask yourself, well, would, would, would I have a chance? And the answer is, yes, I'd have a chance. Many people have done that. I mean, people have given up the piano or the violin for a substantial period of time, deteriorated in their skill, skills, but they still have a plastic brain and they have the capacity to improve that their abilities in controlling that instrument and the re-establishing their master listening. And the simple fact, Alex, is, is that most people as adults aren't practicing enough, practicing enough as listeners, practicing enough in making sense of what it is they hear or what it is they see or what it is what they're doing. And partly they do that because in early life, it's all about acquiring ability. It's all about really being engaged in life with the world and trying to understand it and operate on it and getting good at the million and one things that you need to be good at to operate successfully. And then to a large extent, you begin to rest on your laurels and you begin to use skills and abilities that you've largely developed earlier in life and you're using them unthinkingly automatically. People begin to sleepwalk through life. They're sort of like zombies, and we're encouraged to do this by a modern life, a modern life in which the whole of our culture is designed to make things so that we can operate largely unthinkingly. Now, one of the examples I use for this, Alex, is I tell people, go out in the street where you live in your mind, not in reality, go in your mind, and reconstruct it in your mind in detail. Try to remember in your mind as you sit in your easy chair or somewhere in your office, what exactly is there? And then think about a street maybe in your town or in your in your city, two or three or four blocks away, some place that you go regularly and reconstruct what's there in detail. And then go look, go see what's there. It's the rare individual that's not a little bit shocked that they don't remember what's there. We've been constructed in our to to be masters of our environment, to know about the details of the world around us. We're supposed to be good at that, but we're not good at it because in a modern life, in a modern brain, we sleepwalk through it. And 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 we do this in all kinds of ways. As a listener, we do this in all kinds of ways in our operations and vision or the control of our actions. And this contribute substantially to our progressive deterioration, to the rise of the noisiness of our brains that make it go slower and slower and resolve things with less and less reliability. And of course, slower and unreliable brain is a brain that can't record information and can't operate it with any cognitive power. So uh, it's better to change what you do in life and it's better to think about what you need to increase your brain power. And one of the things that we've done a lot of is try to uh, develop strategies so that a person can relatively efficiently improve their brain power. And one of the things that we've done is develop these methods that commonly require that you go through a course of training, and the training might take uh, 10 or 15 or 20 or 30 or sometimes many more hours, depending upon how far in the hole you are. Each training exercise that you do defines what, what, what your ability level is and then drives you uh, as fast as you can, it can in as far in a correct direction as, as you can move. That's the whole strategy. The whole strategy is to customize the training to you by rapidly coming up to the edge of where you can and cannot make distinctions about what you hear and then slowly drive you in a stronger and more powerful direction. We do that in all of the key abilities that we think relate to accurate speech reception, to accurate listening. And uh, we confirm that this is effective by basically conducting complicated outcome trials in university settings. So for our listening exercise that we apply to adults, for example, the trial was conducted at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester in Minnesota and at, this, and at the University of Southern California in a famous aging institute there. And basically what we've done is look carefully at whether we're driving significant changes in the brain by listening training. And then we've looked at whether or not the changes are sustained across time, basically how long the change is good for and, and how much we need to continue to apply, you could say, booster shots in training to keep up those abilities. Now, I just tell you that if you train for about 35 or 40 hours in an exercise like this and you actually complete the training, which about 85% of people that were enrolled in these trials did, the gain translates to about 14 years in your cognitive abilities. 
And that's measuring your cognitive abilities broadly. So I just looked at how well you're doing cognitive. I said, Alex, how old are you cognitively? You would maybe start by being your age. Let's say that you were 60 or 70. You, you would measure on the statistical average to be 60 or 70, of course. And now I train you. And now I find that on the average, you're about 14 years younger in your cognitive age. If you started at 60, now you're 14 years younger. You now look like a 46-year-old. Or if you started at 70, you now look like a 56-year-old. Now, that's a big difference. But it, it's better than a facelift. It's better than a facelift. It's a lot cheaper. <laughs> and, and, it, and, and it takes a lot less effort. You know, still people find it effortful. You know that people, you know so many people could, could find your training to be so valuable, and yet lots of people struggle with finding the time. Even though what you're doing is quite enjoyable in many ways and interesting, Still, people are so busy, you know, they're so, you know, we have, we recently completed a study in another class of training with a scientist at, at the University of Iowa where he's trained about 700 people, and they trained for 10 hours, and he, and he, and he, and he, and he defined uh, multiple abilities that were improved, everything he looked at just about that related in any sense to that, how they were trained improved significantly, very significantly, and then he asked, well, how long does this last? How long is the person better? And there the answer was, the person was better with 10 hours. Not very much. 10 hours is not very much. By about, for about two to about seven years. Now that's a pretty big benefit for a whole pile of things that a person is better at, more powerfully at, powerful at after not very long in training. 10 hours is an investment that anybody should be able to make. Certainly, and it's I, you know, I think the, the nature of these programs, and we've you know we've struggled with it over the years, is that it does take commitment, and right. it isn't it isn't casual exposure right. that that changes the brain. It, it's right. got to be specific, have the right frequency, intensity, right. duration, and you you need you need to stick with it. Um, yeah, and one of the issues, as you know, Alex, is that if people believe in in its powers, but in advance, of course, they're good soldiers, and they'll generally certainly. get it done. But if you're in brain training, of course, just like physical exercise, you don't, you're not, uh, you're not able to jump through hoops on the first day in the gym, right? I mean, you you've got to be in there for five or six or seven days, maybe two weeks before you say, hey, something's happening. I mean, ultimately, our experience is almost everybody before too long actually senses clearly, and it, and if we ask them to tell us how they're doing day by day, they quite quickly say that they're sense detecting or sensing a difference, and it matters to them. But of course, they have to be with it a little while. You have to carry them that far down the path. So the, so the challenge is, you know, the trend that I've seen, you know, evolve in the brain fitness field over the, you know, what we're now in the second decade uh, in, in this work as a whole right. is applying gamification to feed the brain's reward network so that we're getting that feedback and we're getting the motivation to continue on to that next training session. Alex, and that's... That's true, but one of the problems with that is that the things that are the most game-like are actually the are actually not as beneficial. And you know, let me just say something about I'm this. So, that, I'm so glad you said that. Yeah, that a lot of people do not understand. Um, and let me let me put it in a simple way. A lot of people, and, and this is not it's not just the public. It's also people that have, have have developed these programs from the platform, usually of a perspective of psychology. So a simple way to think about it is I, I say, well, I can't remember, so what am I supposed to do? And the intuitive thing to say was I better practice remembering. Now, the problem with that is, is that if you can't remember what you hear, the fundamental problem is not going to be solved by practicing remembering. Right. What you need is listening training because your problem fundamentally, Alex, as you know, is that you're not representing information in the brain in a clear form. When you're receiving information from hearing, you're now doing a sloppy job of translating it into brain activity. So you actually have to train the brain to be a better, to be a better, more effective machine at making that translation in, in a good form. And only that will empower, immediately empower improved listening and the, and the more, and the greater capacity to retain information in memory over relatively long periods of time 
And that's really what you and you have to think about how you change the system neurologically, not just deal with the sort of superficial problem that you think you have. Well, and I think that's, you know, for the public and for professionals working in these fields is to differentiate. There is a distinct difference between brain games and plasticity-based right. training right. that has an effect. And to the layperson, it's very difficult to apply the filter to understand what's what. That's true. And the other thing that's very confusing to people is that, uh, there, there, you know, lot, there are many, many claims, many, many arguments about the neuroscience basis of what people do, but actually, uh, the number, I mean, the number of control trials in which the outcomes have been clearly validated or limited in many of these areas are non-existent, and some people that make the loudest noise have the almost the least evidence. And uh, so that's another problem that plagues us, and it's also plaguing now public conception because people people uh, are reporting that brain this brain game or that brain game is not effective, and the reality is is that some brain games aren't effective. Right. You know, it's easy to develop a strategy that is ineffective and doesn't work, and uh, and uh, they they're contaminating the well. I mean, uh, in fact, there are things that do work very effectively. And uh, people can really be helped by, and that, and uh, it frustrates those people getting access to them. Yeah, most certainly. Uh, Todd, can I make one last point about this this uh, brain training subject before we open this up for question? Please do. Uh, I want to say that. Oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually extend what I'm saying. Say two two things because I know so notice that a lot of questions that you have that you have received that you forwarded to me so kindly relate to the interest of somebody that has someone they love who is struggling, a kid or an adult, someone that's struggling because their brain is wounded or or the child is uh or the child has a developmental disorder that's really limiting their life or frustrating them and and I just want you to tell you tell tell the people that are listening that this is a an area where from which help will come, is coming and will come. I mean we're trying hard to customize training to create courses in training. We have things now, a number of things that we've developed, uh, Alec, that, that are in uh, that are in uh, serious sort of gold standard trials. Several things are being evaluated now by the Food and Drug Administration because we want to make medical claims so that doctors will prescribe them so that the kid can get them or the adult can get them. Some of these things relate to brain injury, some relate to psychotic illness, some relate to developmental problems in children. And we're also working very, very intensively in research in several of these areas. We're, we're interested in children that have terrible childhoods, childhoods that's full of struggles and stresses and abuse. We're interested in children that have struggle from genetically based disorders like autism and, and its relatives, other pervasive developmental disorders. We're working in children that have uh, problems with attentional disorder or, or anxiety, con control of anxiety or attention. We're, we're looking at, with children that are, have been fallen into uh, uh, a life of misconduct and are in, uh, under the jurisdiction of the court at an older age. Uh, we're working with adults that have variously injured brains. All of these areas are areas of help, and, and we're trying to make progress as fast as we can, and things will come down from the science to help these populations. You'll see some references to this in my book, in, in a, which again is called Softwired. When it's, it'll be published in about three months, you can find it on Amazon. And when you look at it, you'll find that there are notes on the internet which provide you with some indication of the, my best understanding of the, nat of the state of the science. And you'll also find a place there where I'll continue, to, I'll invite the community of specialists of experts in these areas that are doing this kind of research to continually update it and to try to make you aware of what's happening, what's available, what's possible. It can never be complete, but we're just trying our best. Now, the last point I want to make is that we've been training people who are average or above average or far above average. And basically making, and we've been very interested in seeing what we can do for the average person that's doing well. And we've been training people as listeners, and we've been training them more broadly, uh, starting with listening and then extending them to other faculties. We'd love to include a component, Alex, of, of uh, training in 
and music with us. We think that would be empowering and, and a terrific addition. But what we're what we've you'll see this come out in a couple ways. One is is that I've just completed a reality program with a producer from Australia in which we took a uh, an executive, a person that heads an Australian company that has 1,100 employees, a person that's far above average. His name is Todd Sampson. He's a television personality. Every every Australian knows this guy. He's a cool guy, very, very smart man. And what we did in this program is to use, say as a demonstration, well, how much can we change this person's brain and ability for the better? So over a three-month period, we developed a, a program for him to see how much could we change Todd. And this, he was very cooperative and positive. He probably spent 120 or 130 hours across this period of time working with us. 30 of those hours were spent at the Brain HQ Brain Gym. Now that's where you can find these programs that we have in listening and in other in, in other faculties at a place called Brain HQ www.brainhq.com. Anyway, Todd, basically we measured him in a whole bunch of ways that related to his intelligence and his operational abilities. We we did four four and a half five hours of brain recording and imaging before training and after training after this experience. Now I'll just tell you a few things that happened to Todd. Everything we measured behaviorally went up. We measured all kinds of things that related to his performance abilities and went up with this tra intensive training. Todd has a brain that is clearly a more powerful brain. Every way we looked at his brain, in the, in, we looked nine different ways, the brain is more powerfully operating and connected. It's faster, it's more reliable, it's more precise, it has stronger connections in, in its operational machinery, it's a more powerful brain. We have a series of changes that relate to his intelligence. Todd started smart. Todd is smarter. No question that Todd is smarter. Todd came in about uh, six weeks into training, with training with our programs and with training in memory skills, 52nd in the World Memory Championship in London. Todd could, could remember all of the cards in a deck of cards forward and backward and repeat that in less than two minutes. Todd could do all kinds of things after training that he could not do before. And I'm just seeing, saying this as an example of an individual that's even well above average who has these same assets that everyone that's listening have. You have these assets. You have this power to be better, to be stronger, more reliable, faster, to have a better memory, to be better, more in control, and to be safer. And, uh, and that applies to you no matter what your situation. It applies to you whether you've had a wounded brain or you have a, a brain that's doing uh, more or less average or you have a brain that's been doing great. You can be better and stronger. And what it means for me, Alex, is that it's all about making the most out of this asset that you have in life. You know, in a sense, we all have this uh, God-given or Mother Nature-given gift. And uh, we're sort of foolish not to make the most of it by engaging it in these forms of training. I, I really think in, in these comments that you've, you've shared that you illustrate uh, a great amount of hope uh, for those that have uh, the privilege of you know, listening to this evening's call. What do you, you know, what do you say to the parent of a severely brain injured child who's been told by the professionals that their opportunities are going to be limited? Um, you, you can count on a life of pain, struggle, and heartache. You know, what, what do you what do you say to those parents well, with, this, with this opportunity of our of our plastic brain? It's a great it's a great question because uh, you, you know one of the last things you want to do is to engender false hope, but that child's brain is plastic. Now sometimes it's very difficult for the child's brain to get off the mark to get really started in a progression, and in which they can they can go very far. You know, one of the critical things is to just get it moving in a strengthening and corrective direction. And basically, every little piece of progress has to be celebrated because the brain knows about those celebrations. And, it, and, it, and if the brain can begin to interpret those, those victories as victories, you know, you can, make, you can move long distances when, in tiny steps over a period of time. The critical thing is to keep the motion, keep the motion up. And one of the problems that a parent has is, is, is simple. They don't know 
how to start. And they don't know basically how to engage the child in a way that puts them on this progression. And they're sort of at the mercy of the behavioral therapy apparatus that's out there that's also often confused. They would be very lucky to end up with a therapist that has a really good prospect or understanding of how to make these progressions. So so you know and I know that that we're trying hard to educate people about how to carry them across these these landscapes of change in, that actually can give the child a good chance. And, of and, course, and we it, don't know it's possible. We don't know what's possible. You know, I, I have I have met 20 people have, uh, who have one way or another have said, well, they said we should pull the plug on Bill. You know, I've written about a couple people like this in my book. You know, uh, this this guy's going to be a vegetable. I, I have one guy that we've that was substantially inoperable for a long period of time, and he, he got into engaged in our training, and he's amazing. He's engaged to be married. He's he he's been taking care of himself. He's got a job. Uh, he he's playing the guitar again. He's and and and, and actually has quite a nice, uh, uh, although a little bit of peculiar voice. He's he's got a life again. And they told the, his parents again that that situation was hopeless. He was going to have a life of vegetation. It just wasn't true. And so you know it's a struggle. It's difficult. There's not a miracle in every house where there's somebody struggling. But but but. Uh, you know, part of this is it's a, it's a, that the brain is plastic, even when it's uh, substantially distressed. It's to try to get back in, in a strong enough position so the advance can be measurable, and you can see a little bit of advance or progress occurring almost every day. That's what you want to be. That's the mode you want to be in if that's at all possible to achieve. And we're trying to help people get there. You know, what's frustrating to me, Alex, is, is that we're not delivering more and better help to people and more and clearer explanations. That's one of the reasons I wrote this book. Well, on on that clear explanation topic, you know, one one thing we may have taken for granted in this call is that all of our listeners have a fundamental understanding of what brain plasticity is right. neurophysiologically. Could right. you maybe just take a moment and uh, take us through a tour of what happens when your brain physically changes from a layperson's perspective? Right. Well, the brain uh, is basically changing its local wiring as I acquire an ability. So it's easiest to think about this in, within the framework of a simple task. Let's, let's say that I pick up a, a – uh, let's say that I'm a child and I, for the first time I grasp and pick up a spoon. And I've already watched other people use the spoon, so I know what it's for. I know that somehow I'm supposed to, uh, or I begin to understand, somehow it's a, it's, a, it's a tool that I'm supposed to use to uh, scoop up things and bring them up to my mouth. And I know I want those things because I've already been receiving them with other people delivering to them with this tool. So I grasp it, and of course, initially I grasp it crudely, and, and I have very little control of my hand, and I have very poor information coming back from my hand, from my skin, and from muscles and joints, because all of that information is un unrefined. And I, I, I make an attempt to use the tool, and I fail. And when I fail, the brain basically understands that. It understands when it's rewarded by the food or not. And it also has created already a model in its in its memory about what it's like. It's watched you use it. It's watched mom use it. And it knows, uh, in a vague sense at least, what successful use would be like. Let's say it tries again and it succeeds. And if it succeeds, what the brain does is it evaluates that success. As soon as it determines that that's been, it could be either judge it to be successful because it got some food, that's success. Or maybe it just feels good about the try. And when it does that, the brain basically goes back in time, in a brief moment in time when you perform the act of using the spoon, and it strengthens every little wiring connection, just a little. And it does that in try after try after try after try. And basically what it's doing is strengthening the wiring for all of those things that contribute to success. So it evolves, ultimately, a master controller for controlling this tool. Pretty soon, you, as with thousands and thousands of practice tries, you can pick up the spoon, any spoon, any which way. You can load it with anything, something fluffy and light or heavy and uh, that, that and in a big pile or a little, little tiny nip. You can carry it up and deliver it to your mouth, out of view, 
out of sight to dump it in the mouth flawlessly. You can do it, in fact, automatically, unthinkingly under almost any condition. And all of that occurs because your brain has gradually changed its wiring. The brain basically interprets whether this, whether the attempt has been successful or not, and on that basis it says, change that one. That was a good one. And a thousand, a ten thousand, a hundred thousand times later, you become a master at playing your fiddle or, or using your spoon. So the brain has this great trick, this basic way, basic way to evaluate success and use that to guide that to guide brain change. No, I, th I think that's a, that's a beautiful description, and I think one one topic that I I think is on on so many minds that I just want to touch on before we move to a Q and A. You know, we've got what 74 million Americans that are in the baby boom generation. Right. You know, one of the greatest fears is you know the development of uh, a neurodegenerative disease, a uh, right. form of dementia. What you know, what is the What's the most exciting development that you see in neuroscience that gives us some hope of understanding how, for one, perhaps to prevent that decline and to to arrest it uh, in in progress? Well, is that their hope? Yeah, that's a wonderful question, and and it's one of the things that's in the top of our research and the top of our minds. And actually, uh, one of the things that we're mounting at Brain HQ, in the, and it will be initiated about the 1st of July, uh, we're, we're ex this really re is something that we've been doing for a while, but we've been doing it in the research laboratory and not, in the, not for the public, is we're actually I introducing a program to the public, which is designed to, to, uh, to delay or prevent the progressive change in the brain that can lead to uh, to neuropathological illness, where primary focus is on Alzheimer's disease, but we have a secondary, uh, equally a strong interest, a little bit farther down the road on on Parkinson's disease, something that we're studying uh, intensively. Now, I believe that both of these conditions, that in almost any individual, you can increase resilience in the brain in ways that make a person safer. And what we're trying to do, Alex, is we're trying to train the person in a way in which we evaluate the status of the brain in the areas that we know will be at highest risk to, to succumb to the pathology, and we're trying to keep them in a state in which we think they will be, the individual will be safe from the, from the emergence of the pathology. Or if the pathology is already in place, we think we can probably slow down its progression. And this is based upon complicated experiments in animal models and in humans that we've completed to this day. But I think that we're going to see an era in which we're able to keep people safe and able to monitor how they're doing, and able to keep them uh, in a in a uh, in a secure position much longer in life. And we hope for many individuals, many more individuals, to the end of life. You know what pe people don't realize is that most people that are beyond, uh, say, age 50, can expect to live in their mid 80s. But by the time they're there, half of them will be senile. And if we don't change that, you know, we have a public health and disaster, but it's greater than that, Alex, because think of the human suffering and the, and the wasted time and life that comes from all of that. We have to do something about this. And we, I think that there's real hope here. I think that we can do something. And we've done a lot of things that indicate that we can, and that's what we're trying to deliver. I think that's the best news I've heard on the call so far. So thank you for sharing. And I just, you know, I want to thank you for. Uh, the decades of commitment um, that, that you've given to um, society on a whole to understand our brain better, to understand how it changes and how it's shaped, and uh, I think behalf on all of, of all of us that are on this call, how grateful we are for your pioneering in this area. Well, Alex, we're on the same team, and we're trying hard to help people in need, and that's that's what this is all about. Yeah, it, it is. I want to give our listeners an opportunity to ask a question of Dr. Merzenich while we're here. So uh, we are in Q&A mode. If you have a question that you'd like to uh, ask, press star 7 on your phone, um, and uh, I'll, I'll be watching for you here. And go ahead and uh, ask your question. So phone lines are open, and press star 7 if you'd like to ask a question. I see that we uh, have a caller on the line. Hello. Please uh, uh, state your name and where you're calling from and your question for Dr. Mersenick, please. Okay. My name is Linda, and I live in Canada. Right. Hi, Linda. And, welcome. 
The question I have is, in 1991, I had gone to the Montreal Neurological Institute right. to have an epileptic focus removed. Right. What they removed is the amygdala and the hippocampectomy, but they left the epileptic focus in the brain. Uh, so I call myself retarded with awareness because I basically that's what it is. I had post-secondary education before that. Today I can't learn anymore because right. I have no short-term memory to retain. Right. Uh, so ha, what do you do for something like that? Well, you know, we we actually I just uh, I had a conversation earlier today with a young man who we with a very similar history. He actually had a what was called a, what's called an oligodendrocytoma. And he had the amygdala, and he had uh, he, uh, the damage in the tumor removal came, went for, extended from the amygdala to the hippocampus. So it's somewhat similar to your situation. He's actually gone through a very intensive period of training. It's been guided by us uh, because uh, because we want him to go through a particular course of training. I can just tell you that if you it would probably you should probably think of going to Brain HQ to this website. Mm -hmm. And and t t taking that on seriously, and it, there's nothing there that can do be anything but good for you. And and by all means, you you contact me later if it does or does not benefit you, and you let me know. I would be very interested in your particular case because I think this is an extremely interesting class of person. Well, and, we do um, here in Canada. We have a group of neuroscientists in Quebec. They made um, a software program called Neuroactive. Right. And um, you download I, that and it's all kinds of games, right? I and have no I, idea I, about the validity of that and and, uh, and or and I don't I'm unfamiliar with any um with any control trial that demonstrates that it is valid or not valid. I just can't comment on it. Okay, fair enough. Uh, uh, uh but uh you know, it might be useful and it might not. I just can't know. No, you don't. Um, next week, uh, we have a, a gentleman coming from Arizona to right. Ottawa. Right. It's Dr. Klein. Right. And he's a neuroscientist himself, and he's going to be talking about neuroplasticity on the 12th here in Ottawa. Right. Well, that would be worthwhile and interesting for you to probably take up. And, but uh, I'm, gonna, to I'm on the website, sir. I'm going to look at that, but don't, you must have to pay for that, right? Well, it's not terribly expensive, and there are things that you can do for free to see if it looks like it would be appropriate for you too. So, you might look yeah, at it, and it's not, but it's not terribly expensive. Oh, it is it's, not. It, it's designed to be something that anyone can do. So you can do it for a couple months, and it's just not very much money. Is uh, is this similar to Lumosity? Well, I, I I'd like to say yes and no. It's similar in the sense that you go to a uh, to website, and and what you do is on the uh, is on the site. Uh, I'm sorry, my phone is ringing here, and I don't know how to stop it, even though I'm on the phone. <laughs> and I'm afraid okay. to hang this up. Is, because... This is a live call. <laughs> but what I can say about Lumosity is that, uh, again, it represents an attempt to, to, what I would say, to substantially train to the problem. So most of the training involves things like memory, direct memory training, and I don't think it's quite as direct to to uh, getting to the underlying neurological causes of the problem, but right. but this is something that they might argue with, and then they have relatively limited evidence based upon controlled outcome trials that what they have actually works. Okay. And uh, so, you know, I think that one thing I would strongly suggest that people do is to look for the evidence. Look for the evidence in from a scientific uh, on the scientific level of whether things are actually effective. Right. And uh, so we published the outcome of about 60 different control trials, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, and and there's, it represents a powerful body of evidence that demonstrates that what we do is effective. Well, what I'm going to do, Pam, is... Pam, I, I'm 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 afraid we're we are out of time for any continuation on your question, and I apologize. Okay, thank, thank you very you much for your time. So much, and we wish you the very the very best of luck. And please let Dr. Mersenick know your your results. Thank you very much. Bye thank now. You. Bye-bye.
So, um, believe it or not, our our hour has uh, passed, but I, I do believe um, that we've addressed many of the questions that have come in from our from our callers this evening. And uh, for those of you that listened, I encourage you to listen back to the recording. Uh, I'd like to uh, say thank you to Dr. Merzenich and each of you for joining us this evening and feel very free and welcome to uh, share this with others so we can spread the good news uh, about our brain's potential. And be sure to watch for Dr. Merzenich on Smarter Brains, a new special premiering on PBS stations in August 2013, and look for his upcoming book release of Softwired, How the New Science of Brain Plasticity Can Change Your Life. You can learn more about the book at www.soft-wired.com. Um, so in reviewing these questions, I see that also many of you have had questions about the listening program. To learn more about the listening program and our work at Advanced Brain Technologies, please visit us at www.advancedbrain.com or give us a call in the U.S. at 1-801-622. 5676 and we'll be very happy to assist you. So thank you all for listening and to Dr. Merzenich for sharing this very special hour with us. And is uh, what's the best way to uh, learn more about your work beyond the uh, softwire.com website? Dr. Well, Merzenich? by all means, come to uh, www.brainhq, brainhq, brainheadquarters.com or go to the POSIT science, P-O-S-I-T science website and we have a lot of information and in fact Alex we have a we have a nice uh, 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 scientific document that we send out to people that basically provides a kind of update of what we think is happening that's important for them to know about the science domain is these uh, wonderful uh, seminars that you're providing provide to help people with and uh, and again uh, people can find more information so go for the www.positescience.com or to uh, to brainhq.com and you can find that information and Alex I want to thank you and uh, you're doing good work and I really appreciate what you what you're doing and and how you're trying to help and I want to thank the audience for being patient with this uh, very complicated uh, uh, topic and I wish we had another hour uh, I I I too do too. Maybe we could follow up after the book comes out. So have a have a good evening, Dr. Merznick, and to everyone on the call and everyone be well. Thanks. Thanks, Alex. Good night. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Advanced Brain Podcast with best selling author, keynote speaker, and founder of Advanced Brain Technologies, Alex Doman. In the show notes, you can find links to all the resources mentioned in this episode. Please subscribe to the podcast from whichever platform you might be listening in. Of course, it's free to subscribe, and it ensures that every time we post a new episode, you'll find it right there waiting for you to listen to in your podcast app of choice. And for more information regarding the world's most innovative neuroscience-based music programs for optimal human performance, please visit advancedbrain.com dot com.